Hi everyone, my name is Ruth Samalo and I'm one of the featured programmers for Token YC and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Q&A for American Rap Star. And we have director Justin Staple and we have Kirstin M. Hoff, producer. Um, thank you both for being here with us and thank you for this movie, how are you? Very, very well. Thank you very much for programming it and thank you to the audience who bought a ticket. I really appreciate it. You guys are some of the first people to see this film and um, I hope you enjoyed it at home and just thank you very much and feel free to uh, send me a comment about how you felt about it afterwards if you'd like. <laughs> I mean, there's, this is definitely a film that requires conversations and that leaves you like with the, with the sense that you want to talk more about it and find more about it. Um, Justin, tell me a little bit about um, you, you, you told me briefly before that, that you uh, use the music filter for your films and for your audiovisual work as a way to talk about deeper social issues. And I think that's one of the brilliant things of this film, that you're like really tackling an incredible issue of like, you know, the anxiety that our young people are feeling, you know, the drug addiction, the opioid epidemic you know, this like feeling of like disconnectness at the same time, like over connection driven by social media. It is this really large, very deep themes, but then you hone in, in this very like, at least for me, very unknown scene of the lo-fi, you know, trap rap scene. So tell us a little bit about what was your, um, what, what's your relationship with the project and when, when did it start and how did you end up bringing us into like this very specific group of people that are like the largest representatives of the scene? Yeah, through my documentary work, I like to highlight a lot of social issues that I find important. And often in my work, I, I find that youth culture issues are overlooked as the news media and other things are more focused on adult issues. And I've been working in, my, in documentary content for about 10 plus years. And I found that the easiest way to make social issues digestible for young people is through presenting them through a pop culture perspective or through the perspective of people that they like best, think like Rock the Vote, MTV's campaign back in the day. So mm -hmm. social, you know, young people are very anxious right now and very depressed right now. And there's a lot of different issues that are now starting to get attention, but um, are hugely important, especially as the world starts to change all around us. And um, I, I felt like a lot of these characters that I showed in the film were symbolic of these issues, whether it be gun violence through the lens of XXXTentacion, whether it be drug overdoses through Little Peep or Little Xan, or whether it be social media addiction or how social media influences their lives, like in the case of Matt Ox, who you see in the beginning, or Bad Baby, whose whole career was birthed through reality TV and social media. So I, I saw these characters as more than just characters, but as symbols of the issues that young people are thinking about today and that affect young people today. So um, I've been gathering footage with a lot of these rappers throughout the years. I do a lot of music content on different mediums, whether it be on the radio or I even make beats with some of them or music videos is what I'm doing a lot of now. But I wanted to kind of elevate it to a more premium level and tell a bigger story with the hopes that young people could watch it around the world and feel like it was okay that they were going through this, that other people were going through this as well or as an explainer to some parents was my original pitch as well. The parents are just like you. They've never heard of these people, but their teenage kids are listening to all these people and emulating what they see and repeating the lyrics and, and doing what have you. So it was kind of an explainer to that generation of what the younger kids were uh, listening to. As I started to film more of these interviews and um, more of the day in the life of some of these stars, I found that I was onto something there, that there was a cohesive factor with the rise of streaming and the rise of the drug use and the fentanyl press drug use and the Trump era anxiety and of course gun violence in schools or on the streets. And another reporter, John Karamanica from the New York Times was kind of on that same um, wave. Like I, I opened the art section Sunday New York Times and saw, wow, Little Peep is right on the front page there above the fold in the New York Times. Smoke Perp and Little Pump, he had reported on in the New York Times. and. When the New York Times covers something, it really legitimizes it. And I had been a friend with Karamanica for, you know, five to eight years now and decided to get his take on it as kind of the expert voice to guide us through the scene and place it in a larger context. Once I completed that interview inside the New York Times building, which was really exciting to do, it really brought the whole thing together for me and, and let some of these cohesive points shine. So my hope for it is the takeaway is that this is a very dangerous and anxiety-ridden time for young people 
And um, just my goal is to raise a spotlight on that. And also the music is great too. I mean, like you said, a lot of people haven't heard of that scene, but it's hard hitting aggressive music. We talk about how it's a lot like the punk scene in the late seventies, early eighties. And um, when concerts are allowed again, the concerts are a ton of fun. There's moshing, stage diving, all of that. So wanted it to be an entertaining ride, which I hope you guys liked it and found it entertaining, but also kind of bring some awareness to some serious issues that I wanted to highlight. And I think it was really important to bring, you know, John Carmonica in it because he, but, but that also was like a, a strong decision that tells me that this film is made for me, not necessarily made for the kids, you know, or for the people of that generation. So, <clears throat> In a way, I think, uh, as you said, you know, when, when you were like trying to pitch the film as like an explainer for, for the parents of this generation, right? Um, what do you think that, um, that we need to be doing? Because something that I really like in the film is how there's never any dismissal. There is always taking them really seriously, you know, as artists, as humans. And there is like, you know, a couple of moments where like somebody says, you gotta trust the kids, you know, maybe not with the moral compass, you know, or with the ethics because they're not yet fully formed, but you know, you trust them. Like they are telling you something, they have a message, you know, and, and it's it's of clarity and it's of, uh, you know, it, it's, it's dense, even if it's in short, you know, beats and, you know, and, and short lyrics. But um, so tell us a little bit about how, you know, um, this dichotomy of like trusting the kids, but then making a film for the adults. Yeah, I like to look at generational differences. I'm of the like, like millennial generation and I spend a lot of time thinking about with Gen Z, how they differ from the millennials, how we differ from Gen X and the boomer generation. With Gen Z, they're the first generation to grow up with iPhones in their hand and, and the internet device in their hand by 10, 11 years old. That change between my generation and their generation, I find like super radical. It opens up a whole new world for better or for worse, usually for worse to these young minds. And that has completely changed that generation in ways that I think people underestimate and still don't fully understand. It's the biggest consumer base. These young people are growing up and spending the most money. It's a big voting base. It's a very influential base as far as fashion and trends and culture. And a lot of different people are trying to understand that. How has growing up with iPhone or TikTok or Instagram changed these kids? You'll see in the first act, we have the animation where it's the feedback loop of serotonin of wanting to get likes and posting on social media all day. And that's driven kids to depression. You see little Zan kind of had a mental break there where he keys his Mercedes G-Wagon or Bad Baby in the third act is very telling, talking about kids getting on TikTok and TikTok's marketed as a children's app. And when we did the film, it wasn't the political football it is now where we have Trump and negotiating the rights to TikTok with the Chinese government. But at the time, she sensed that there was some danger in there to have a 12 year old on this app seeing hypersexualized images or this is how you should act because you'll get more likes. Trying to understand that is a very long process. And um, you know that's why I chose this range of characters. Um, and, and you're right, a lot of critics dismiss them. Obviously Bad Baby gets a bad rap in TMZ um, but she's outsmarted the media because she's the voice of able... reason in this documentary, which is brilliant. Right, yeah. right. And I presented her as that because I, when I first met her, you know, I wanted to judge her, but she'll talk to me about her net worth, upwards of two point five million dollars at fourteen, fifteen years old. You know, I'm kind of like maybe she's onto something. That's every kid's dream. Matt Ox, the same deal, signed a million dollar contract when he was fourteen years old. It's like the real life Richie Rich. So whether it's a product of our environment that the millennial generation or the Gen X and boomer generation has created for these kids. They've been able to take advantage of it, capitalize on it, market it, and rake in huge amounts of fame and profit from them. That whole story fascinated me. I, I could I could have probably made the movie hours and hours long <laughs> and just keep going in, but it's a lot for people to handle because it is so different than what you're used to. Yeah, that's why I opened the film with the jarring face tats because that's a big symbol of how this generation is different. They're a visual generation and putting something right on your face there, something like Anne Frank and trying to explain it like that, that's gonna get you more likes and make you go more viral. And that was a good symbol of what these kids care about right now, looking cool, looking viral. And um, it's a, so I kind of, you know, I made the film about 85 minutes for the festival version as an entry point to try to explain all this. So it's a lot for people to swallow. And, I, I, and, and when it plays, people are like, wow, Bad Baby's the voice of reason. That's like, it's so jarring for me. 
So I'm just trying to ease them into this scene. But if you if you go to a high school or you go to a middle school, you know, these are the celebrities to them. XXX Tentacion is their Tupac, is their Michael Jackson, and Little Peep is their Kurt Cobain. Bad Baby is is their pink, maybe, is a good analogy. And um, it's very common to them. So the more time I spend with that generation, the more I'm able to take those kids seriously. And Kirstine, you coming from a, from a production, um, film, video production world, and you're part of the music industry you mentioned early. Um, music films are so hard to make because they're like a lot of involved in, you know, in the, in the sync rights and the publishing rights. It's, it's usually a bit of a clusterfuck for filmmakers. So tell us a little bit about, um, I'm sorry, I have construction work right out of my window that just started now, I apologize. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about um, about the process of like the the licensing and the the relationship with the different labels, the different managements, you know, and the different artists for this film. Well, honestly, um, yes, I come from music videos and and deal with that industry a lot and have dealt with that industry a lot of my career. But this was all Justin, and I when when I first saw you know, the kind of rough pieces that Justin was working on. I'm Gen X. I grew up with punk and the, you know, the early, early rap days. And I was just blown away by what he got and kind of the, the way that these performers just really opened up with him. And, and it's really been his relationship with all of these performers that have, have, you know, kind of, you see it in the film, but also you see it in their support of him and the film. And I think that's what's so important about this film is like, this was not some, you know, guy like Justin, who's just like showing up and like kind of in the background, like these artists really opened up and respected the stories that Justin was telling in this film about them. And I think that's where you see that kind of communication. So where you'd think this was a nightmare of trying to get licenses and, and approvals. It's all been Justin, you know, dealing with the labels. A lot of these are very small labels or management and, you know, and Justin speaks that language. And, and I think that is really the importance of the film is that for my generation, you know, learning, even though I love rap music, I did not know anything about this world. And for me, that's that was the beauty of it is that this film kind of crosses over from their fan base, which is massive, but also into, I think the documentary fan base, which is, you know, older and, you know, not probably exposed to these artists in that way that these stories are so compelling and because they're so honest and so kind of like vulnerable, you really get connected to them. And, and you'd never think that Bad Baby would be like a, a super, you know, emotional and, and a voice of reason. But she, I think she's one of the favorites of everyone after they watch this film. And um, Justin, yeah, I think it's really telling that you did have a very long relationship with some of these young artists. But you also do something that is, I think, really important, which is like, uh, I'm so sorry about the noise. Um, but there is um, to think through how the music industry has been for the last, I will say 20 years, but maybe even longer, kind of like lagging behind the changes in the way that we relate to music. And then I love how you kind of like bring us back to, to the Napster days and see how that disrupted the industry and how it took a very long time for them to, uh, to adapt and like technology adapted first that, that the industry itself. And then you talk about SoundCloud, you know, as this other kind of like, you know, signpost of like definite time in the music industry and democratization of, you know, audio distribution and, and music distribution. Um, tell us a little bit about how do you see, um, and then it's really interesting because you see these artists, these young artists getting like, directly in contact with their fan base and being, you know, like having millions of fans and, and getting to millions of people. But then, you know, the record labels come back out and say, okay, great, you're doing fantastic. Let me get a piece of that. And let me offer you like a few million dollars to, to sign you on. And, and yet that the street cred that they were building on 
suddenly you know is is again eclipsed by like oh i i signed them you know a seven figure deal with you know with atlantic records and so t tell us a little bit about how do you see this in the larger kind of like entertainment and music you know um growth or changes and whether or not we we're still like seeing like um like something really revolutionary about the way that these kids are going about distributing their music to their fan base. Yeah, when I first started seeing the seven figure deals, it was a quick transition. And I think Karen Manica touches on that too. We were friends with a lot of those kids like Smoke Perp, Little Pump. They were 19, 16, 15, just making bedroom rap songs. And then we started seeing the seven figure deals coming from people like Todd Moskowitz or Elliot Grange and Universal. They just announced they're going to have an IPO. They just announced it today. So that's when I was like, oh, there's a movie here. Because as soon as those level of deals, you know, an ASAP Rocky or Post Malone used to get a $3.5 million record deal or, you know, a 5.5 X. And Takashi 69, some of these kids are getting $8.8 .8 million deals, $10 million one album deals. So I'm like, these numbers are completely different. What's happening here? And what really happened is the rise of the streaming services is what I talk about which I feel is really under underreported. But as you see in the film, Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan predict it's going to grow to a $33 billion plus industry throughout the next five years. So a lot of eyes should be on this space right now. Warner Music just IPO'd and Universal Music Group's going to IPO and they're, they're just killing it, especially with people stuck at home. So injected with all this money, this is how these kids could make this stuff on their own terms. No longer does it matter how you present yourself to the public. If you're able to garner your own fan base and garner your own numbers, kind of like the YouTube economy, it's all about the numbers, how many streams you're going to get, you're going to get the attention of the major labels, which is a really revolutionary thing. So it can be a bit dangerous. Now I'm seeing, and I'm even playing with the idea of making a sequel, because now I'm seeing the labels will give big advances to these artists. And you see a lot of artists complaining about this content and what have you. But now the artists can't tour because of COVID or having a harder time selling merch because they're fan base's spending power isn't what it used to be. So now they're stuck, not able to recoup the deal and essentially owing the labels millions of dollars back with no way to tour and make it back to them. So it's very dangerous, tricky situation that often entraps young artists who are often from the inner cities and don't know how to really read the contracts correctly and get into these situations. And at the same time, the major labels are back-end investors of the streaming services, Spotify, and they're in the pocket of Apple, but they're more invested in Spotify, which is kind of the major player right now. So as that grows, the labels profit as well. So you're in the system now where it's kind of homogenized and there's playlisting and a, and a fight. We call it the, uh, the fight for your attention span, the fight for your ear, ear pods, air pods. Everyone's really battling to get that one playlist spot or that one re-listenable song. And now you got new formats on TikTok. So that when I looked at where did the scene come from, which I wanted to explain in the first act, that's what I decided on. The CD industry collapsed with the birth of Napster, which went all the way to Washington and was a huge deal for the music industry. You saw music sales declining, music labels shuttering, CD stores shuttering, and Napster and the MP3 kind of disrupted that. And Spotify, Daniel Elk, was able to do deals with the major labels to legitimize the Napster way of processing. And it took five years. No one really understood Spotify and subscription services. No one really understood iTunes and Apple Music. But finally, we're at the moment where every single person has a subscription to that, as far as at, at least every single person my age. And they're going heavy on podcasting. They're a multi billion dollar company. It is now the way people consume music. And we take that for granted now, but five, six, seven years ago, that was completely unheard of. And I truly believe the rise of the streaming era is what led to the changing of the sound of music. Karamanica says that in the, the film, songs get shorter. Sometimes they're 80 seconds, 90 seconds, so you can get that replay value. The lyrical content is really random. It's all hook driven. Maybe there's a song where the artist is saying just eight words over and over, which in a little pump, he performs D rows in the film. He's literally just saying D rows over and over while 10,000 kids jump up and down to it. And that, that whole thing changed the song because they're optimizing their music for streaming. They're optimizing it for playlisting. They're optimizing it for shareability. If they're telling jokes in their songs, you're more likely a friend is going to send it to another friend and it's going to get shared. So all of this combined was my first act of the movie to set the stage for where the scene birthed from. It was almost coincidental, or maybe not, that a lot of them came from South Florida, as we discussed, because South Florida, you know, anything goes down there. It's a little rougher area. It's 
more punk in its own way. So they were ready. At, you know, you got X from there, Smoke Pert from there, Bad Baby, Little Pump from there. Um, they were ready to just take advantage of that. And a lot of them became millionaires. But like I said, it's tricky now because you'll see Spotify profit, obviously the labels profit on the rise of Spotify and then the rise of their artists. But the artists themselves not being able to tour, not being able to sell merch, not being able to maintain the same kind of relevancy year over year are starting to struggle. So um, it's a tough situation. But, you know, a lot of them that I talk to now are like, hey, at least we're not dead, which is what you saw with a lot of the young stars. The legacy ended early and we have the montage at the end that's super powerful with Juice World, who was at the height of his career, or Mac Miller, who was like a legend to that scene. All of these situations have compounded, but um, it's a tricky, tricky industry, like any industry that capitalizes on art. Yeah. Also, I would add, like, I really feel like that there was something about the punk aspect of these artists. Like, it was a reaction, and, and I lived through that world of doing, like, the biggest music videos, the Nelly videos, and 50 videos, where it was just so formulaic it was like just get a rolls and champagne and a bunch of girls and and all of a sudden then everything fell apart and no one was paying for videos no one was putting any money behind artists and this kind of like grew out of that which was a not only did they have access through the technology with soundcloud but they were also able to be like you know what screw you like we're, we're we are not going to be just another 50 or another Nelly or all these like kind of formulaic rappers at that point. And you see that, you feel that kind of anger and rawness in the music and in these artists. And we saw that with, you know, punk coming out of either the UK or like grunge. It was always like a reaction to what was happening in kind of the mainstream at that point. And I feel like until I started seeing that from the stuff that Justin was shooting and really understanding that, like, that's fascinating to watch. Like these artists were basically, you know, making a major statement from what was in the world at that point, and then using the technology in a way where they really created, here's how we're going to listen. I don't care. You know, I don't give a shit what the labels are saying. We're going to create our own fan bases. We're going to create our own way of listening. And, and, and it just blew up and no one even was paying attention to it. Yeah, and I think that's really important too. Like the fact that they they really had that, like I they don't feel part of the lineage in a way. Like, yeah. you know, while, while previous rappers like felt that they were part of like a previous generations of like music and, and musicians, these guys are like, we, I, I don't give a fuck about public enemy, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. And they, I don't think, e they don't even know who they are. Sorry yeah. to interrupt, but it's so... <laughs> Little Zan, you'll see in the thing, he says Tupac is boring. I know Bad Baby and Matt Ox, they'll tell me, they don't even, they're like, who's Public Enemy, who, Easy, who? They don't, they just don't know who they are. Their OG is like Mac Miller or maybe Kanye Drake, mm -hmm. but even Kanye Drake is like too old for them. So it's like a complete reset because they don't even know, you know, maybe a Post Malone they'll look to or Gucci Mane, but. They don't even know the 90s stuff. <laughs> but it was a little bit like that also, like like what you were saying, Kirsten, like, you know, like when the Sex Pistols came out, it's like, we don't know how to play music, but we don't care. We're going to use three chords and we're going to rock with it. You know, it's like that that irreverence and like energy, as you were saying, I think is really is really interesting and it should be paid attention to. And, and we're going to have to leave it soon. I have so many more questions for you, but I definitely want to know about your new project involving puppies or dogs. Tell us a little bit about that, please. I don't know. Am I allowed to talk about it? <laughs> okay. Go for it. Go for it. Uh, well, we're doing a, you know, with the quarantine time, um, you know, I, I am doing a ton of more music stuff, but I'm feeling the sense that people are becoming more engaged with nature and, and more looking to things outside of industry, about outside of society, outside of pop culture, and more looking inside themselves how to become better people and become more one with their international people and nature. So we're telling a grand story about um, humans' connection with nature through the lens of a very important person who is um, a, a figurehead of that scene and a pioneer in that scene. And I will again be showing a lot of social issues that are important to me, like immigration issues in America and just overcoming different depression and controversies in one's life through the lens of this figure. I'm not gonna divulge who it is quite yet, but it is a, gonna be a beautiful piece that touches on um, 
people's connection with nature and a lot of these other social issues through the lens of pop culture, <laughs> like I often like to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and, and why is Dog Man's best friend? This film will seek to answer that. <laughs> Around the world too, I'm also taking on, you know, the consumption and trade of dog meat in third worlds and in Asia, which is a big serious problem. And I think people will be really um, surprised and shocked to see the way we deal with that and um, hopefully solve some problems with this next movie. I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> yeah. So but more on that soon. I'm not going to divulge too much. <laughs> We're going to be looking forward to that one too. Thank you so much to both of you. And I apologize for the noise. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank, thank you. you very much, Ruth. And thank you to the audience once again for buying tickets. Really appreciate it.